Good morning, everyone. So just to clarify, you're just seeing my screen and not my notes. Is that correct? Yes, correct. Correct. Awesome. Yep. Well, I had this moment where I had to check and be sure that I was unmuted and it wouldn't let me for some reason, so I had to leave the slideshow. But anyway, we're all good. So welcome and good morning. Um, this is Primary Source Sets, an introduction. And today we're going to introduce to you the Minnesota Digital Library's Primary Source Set Program. I'm gonna explain what they are and how we got started on this project. And then I'm gonna walk you through the components of a primary source set. And then we're gonna switch over to Linda Mork and she's going to talk a bit about using the sets in the classroom. And again, just like Sarah explained, please, um, share your questions with us um, as you think of them. So, okay, so jumping in, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna start out talking about Minnesota Reflections. This is a free digital collection and the primary project of the Minnesota Digital Library. And we have 55,000 records or items, actually it's over 55,000, and this content comes from our partners from across the state of Minnesota, um, we currently partner with 197 different libraries, archives, county historical societies, museums, and other cultural heritage organizations. And we digitize their content and then we make it available in Minnesota Reflections. And those, those different collections, those different contributors can help us tell many different stories about Minnesota experiences and life. Minnesota Digital Library's content is made up of a di many different types of records and um, our collection is primarily still images, text-based items, and cartographic materials. And we do have a smaller number of audio and video materials and a few three-dimensional objects. And so when I say still images and text-based materials, I do want to emphasize that still images can be things like photographs, prints, drawings, postcards, um, posters, architectural drawings, a whole array of things. And text can be anything that is text-based, things like letters, journals, um, weather diaries, booklets, pamphlets, programs, and more. So, and cartographic, just as it sounds, it's maps and atlases. Okay, so that's a little bit of a background about who we are with the Minnesota Digital Library. And now I want to share with you how we got interested in the primary source set project. Minnesota Digital Library is a contributing partner to the Digital Public Library of America. And DPLA collects digitized content from all over the United States and aggregates it and makes it available in a single website. In October 2015, they announced the release of a new educational resource the primary source set project. And it was when I was looking at primary source sets in DPLA that I had my, what I like to call my light bulb moment. Um, I was looking at a primary source set on Native American boarding schools and realized that over half of the images in the set came from the Minnesota Digital Library collection. And I realized, hey, this is something that we can be do doing locally. So after, after having my light bulb moment, I asked and received permission from DPLA to duplicate this project at the local level, just using our MDL content. And um, before we leave this slide, I do really want to emphasize that the DPLA primary source set resource page is a wonderful resource for everyone, especially for teachers. They currently have over 140 primary source sets on a whole array of topics, topics that extend beyond the scope of the Minnesota Digital Library. We're focused in above and about and in Minnesota, whereas DPLA is all about the American experience. So when we started with this project, um, we had three essential goals. Um, we wanted to help students, we wanted to help teachers, and we wanted to expand the use of existing digital resources. And Linda will be speaking more about these goals later in our webinar. 
So we moved forward with this project in early 2016, and this is what our primary source set landing page looks like today. The address is mintdigital.org forward slash projects forward slash primary dash source dash sets. And today we have 21 titles, not 140 like DPLA, but DPLA has also has a lot more content than we do. So, um, but we also have more sets in development and um, our first, first sets were launched in the spring of 2016. And um, just to mention here that our topics that we have chosen and are showing here are really dictated by two things. It's the interest of the author, as well as content that is available in Minnesota Reflections. And our guest authors have included, or our authors have included Minnesota Digital Library staff, such as myself, Minitech staff, and an array of guest authors, including librarians, curators, historians, and staff from our contributing organizations. And our most recent set was created by one of our contributors, Susan Vosberg, shared items from the Northwestern Health Sciences University Library, where she is the librarian on the history of chiropractic in Minnesota. And you can see that the topics here range from very specific events, like the Teamster Strike of 1934, to more broad topics such as works of literature and more general history. And they also highlight lesser known things um, like the whaleback boats on the Great Lakes. And um, again, really emphasizing that they're just dictated by our collections content. We must have content in Minnesota Reflections to write a primary source set. Now I'm going to walk you through what each set is comprised of. First, um, you will look here, a topic is selected and um, whoever is writing the topic or, or writing the primary source, the author creates a title and writes a short blurb and usually a, usually a few paragraphs, um, which provides an overview of the topic and also adds some historical context for the, re, for the user. Then content is added from Minnesota Reflections and we share that content by sharing a thumbnail of the original image as well as the title as it is found in Minnesota Reflections. And then clicking on either the thumbnail or the title um, that is hyperlinked back to Minnesota Reflections where users can see the full record. Um, this screenshot here shows what the thumbnail and the hyperlink actually look like. Then scrolling down, users will see the online resources and teaching guide. And I'm gonna show these in more detail in the next few slides. So starting with the online resources, um, the author of the set selects articles from online resources. And these are resources that are gonna help provide context, more detailed information on the topic. And um, this really allows the users to read up more about the topic beyond um, beyond the blurb that we provide at the top of the set. So this is a way for somebody to say, jump in and really, really learn more specific information. So the first set of resources we provide is eLibrary Minnesota. And this is a resource that is really for Minnesota residents. Um, and it's a collection of resources for both teachers and students. It includes articles and e-content um, on, con on topics from all just in a whole array of, of content. And um, because we also realize that not everyone using the primary source sets will be in Minnesota, we've also provided a second session section called Additional Resources for Research. And these include vetted and trusted content from libraries, universities, museums, all over the place. And then if you continue to scroll down, each set also includes the primary source analysis toolbar. And you can see the screenshot of it there on the right. And this is taken directly from Digital Public Library of America and used with their permission. This analysis toolbar asks, helps users and creators to ask open-ended questions and also links to two very important resources the document analysis worksheet, which comes from the, Nas the National Archives, 
and a second resource called Using Primary Source Sets, which comes from the Library of Congress. And scrolling down further, we get to the teaching guides, discussion questions, and classroom activities. These questions and activities are designed to help students think critically and to help, help teachers get started with using the resource. It is also intended as a jumping off point for teachers to get them started with using the content and perhaps adding to or slightly altering or changing this content to suit their own classroom needs. And I should also mention that some of these sets lend themselves to this type of critical analysis better than others. Okay, so that was a lot of information to digest in a short amount of time. Um, we are going to, I'm gonna pause here, and at first I'd like to ask if anybody has any questions at this point. And um, we're gonna take a quick five minute break and we're gonna switch presenters. And I'm gonna turn things over to Linda who will talk about using primary source sets um, in the classroom and with teachers. And if you want to, you can take this five minutes to either ask a question, you can unmute yourself, or you can ask a question in the chat box, or you could actually check out a primary source set online. And we are gonna be right back. So we'll see you in just a moment. I've also just shared the link in the chat if you want to copy and paste that <clears throat> take a look while we're oh sorry I did that too. <laughs> oh okay I just saw it yeah. <laughs> you beat me to it that's okay Same um, all right <laughs> so we'll resume in about three minutes <laughs> I'm enjoying this break photograph and looking at the 
amazing hair of the woman in the front there. Greta, if you're still, <laughs> yes. if you're still around. What year was this? Do you remember? Uh, I think it's late 60s, I believe. Mid to late 60s. That'd be a good guess, yeah. Yeah, I love the percolator coffee maker she has. And all yeah. the is a styrofoam cup, it looks like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it uh, looks like it's 1021, so our short break is up. Uh, so if you're looking at a different browser window or something, go ahead and come back to us, please. And we will get started with Linda. So Linda, whenever you're ready. Okay, great. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm Linda Mork, and I am a reference outreach and instruction librarian here at Minitex. Um, but my former career was as a high school English teacher. Um, I taught in the Anoka Hennepin School District for about 23 years. Um, and I was also a school library media specialist at both the middle school and um, high school level. And while I was doing that, I was also a history day coach. Um, and uh, these primary source sets are just so great for history day projects. So um, I thought I would talk a little bit about um, how and why uh, these primary sources, source sets could fit into um, the classroom. So as Greta said, the goals of this project really were threefold. Um, one is to strengthen student research efforts, um, just even helping them understand what a primary source is, uh, when and why to use primary sources, and just helping them feel comfortable um, with them. The second goal is to help teachers um, again uh, why and how they could use these primary source sets um, in their own classrooms and then to expand the access and use of existing online resources and we really have so many um, excellent online resources here in minnesota and this is just a great way to um, introduce both teachers and students to those resources. So I'm just gonna, as I talk through kind of how you'd use these in the classroom, I'll, I'll keep going back to these goals. So this fall, uh, as part of my job, I go out to um, schools and work with them as they prepare for History Day research. And I was at Southview Middle School in Edina and the uh, sixth grade social studies teacher was asking his class when I was there if they knew what a primary source set or a primary source was. And um, there were a lot of guesses. Um, some of the students thought primary meant like the main source that you're relying on for your research. Um, other students thought maybe it was the first source that you found. So really kind of helping students understand the difference between um, primary and secondary sources is a, uh, a great way to use these uh, resources. So the teacher explained, no, that the you know, primary source really means uh, it's a firsthand account of the events recorded either during or shortly after. Um, the events occurred. So everything that Greta talked about that's included these um, items that are in these primary source sets, photos, letters, reports are going to count as that primary source. And the secondary source of information would be those resources that, and I'll, I'll show you again, the additional resources <clears throat> um, that were created later by someone who did not experience the events. So <clears throat> excuse me, things like textbooks, essays, articles, things about the, the topic. And really to get students to think about not only the difference between what a primary source is and a secondary, but why they might wanna use those primary sources. Um, you know, I have just found as a teacher and going out and presenting to students that really, there is no better way to get them interested in a topic or kind of, you know, perk their attention than telling a story. And so these primary sources really do tell stories about history. 
Um, so, you know, I tell students, if you're not really understanding your topic or you just need a different kind of um, hook to become interested in it, these primary sources can provide a better understanding of the event, the historical event produced by someone who was there or who witnessed it. And that really tends to draw students in. Um, we also talk about the power of persuasion. So for these History Day projects, um, students need a thesis. They need to be creating an argument um, or if they're doing some kind of, you know, historical presentation. Um, and really that there's that sense of having someone who was there, who saw it, who witnessed it, who experienced it is a really powerful um, persuasive piece for students to use in their projects. And then the last reason that I really stress is that students love being subversive. Um, they love finding out um, new angles to things that they may not have um, you know, heard about before. And so these primary sources can provide points of view from individuals whose stories might not be in their history textbooks, who um, might even contradict each other, and so two different people living through the same experience might have vastly different, um, you know, reactions to that, or created totally different meaning, or it might even contradict what we're commonly taught um, in our classes. So students really love that. So just so many reasons to use those primary sources for students. For teachers, um, I'm going to talk um, a little bit about the Minnesota state standards and how these primary source sets are just amazing and really so naturally can help teachers meet those standards. And I know that um, teachers are always, some teachers have to sort of justify their lesson plans and, you know, um, report kind of what standards they're meeting. So I'll show you those in just a minute. Teachers are also incredibly time strapped, especially now when they're trying to work from home and um, teach content and, and deal with their own kids sometimes at home. This is just an amazing, these primary source sets, not only are these items all in one place and grouped according to topic or theme, but as Greta showed you, they come with this teacher support material that is just amazing. It would be really easy, and I'll just show you some examples of just plugging these in um, as a one day lesson or a week unit plan or something like that. And then again, we really, what, what our main goal for our students, what we want them to be, we want them to be critical thinkers. We want them to be curious. Um, we want them to um, have, you know, grit and perseverance and continue to research a topic. And so these primary source sets really lend themselves to um, thinking critically and to doing additional research. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how these primary source sets fit so naturally into the Minnesota state standards. So on the screen here, these are the Minnesota social studies standards, and that seems to be the most natural fit. So um, I'm going to show you what are called the benchmarks, which are the um, skills that students need to do, and I'll just kind of pull out some of them. But um, grades, you know, one through three really are the foundations of social studies, and really even the younger students, these can be used um, with them. And then the main, you know, the big year that students really focus in on Minnesota studies is sixth grade. So, um, and that's when a lot of students do that History Day research project, um, and these just fit so nicely into that, into that unit. Um, so here are those benchmarks, and I just pulled out some that clearly these primary source sets would fit so well. So in kindergarten, um, students need to demonstrate that they can describe ways people learn about the past, and it says specifically um, in that benchmark description, for example, using photos or artifacts. Um, first grade, describe how people lived at a particular time in the past based on historical records and artifacts. 
Second grade, use historical records and artifacts to describe how people's lives have changed over time. And again, specifically calling out using photos to um, provide evidence of that. And third grade, examining historical records, maps, artifacts to answer basic questions about times and events in history. So even at that really lower elementary school level, these primary start sets um, could work really, really well, even just, you know, pulling out a few of the items in each set. And then there's the sixth grade, the big Minnesota history um, emphasis, um, posing quest pose questions about a topic in Minnesota history, gather a variety of primary and secondary sources related to questions, analyze those sources for credibility, identify possible answers, use evidence to draw conclusions, and present supported findings. And these primary source sets could um, you know, work so well for that benchmark. Once students get into um, middle school and high school, we, uh, Minnesota has very general literacy standards and these standards are designed to be met in every subject area. So I could see these primary source sets um, really used across the curriculum. And so um, during their middle school and high school um, years, students need to be able to do um, these types of standards like site-specific textual visual or physical evidence um, to support analysis of primary and secondary sources analyze in detail how a primary and secondary source might be structured. So that really close look at some of those photographs like we were doing um, after the break, um, really noticing details and kind of slowing down, um, evaluating, evaluating differing points of view on the same historical event. That's where these, um, this compilation of different items around the same event might become in really handy. Um, integrate, evaluate multiple sources of information presented in diverse formats, and then integrating information from diverse sources, both primary and secondary, into a coherent understanding of an idea or an event. So again, at the, the secondary level, these primary source sets would work really, really well in meeting the literacy standards um, as well. So um, when I, I use primary sources quite a bit uh, when I was teaching English and we, you know, I think most English teachers, when you say the word text, um, we would interpret that as any kind of text, either written text, print text, or a visual text, or a video, or an artifact. Anything really can be read. Um, and critically read. And so we really emphasize that students need to proceed slowly and methodically. So if you're working with a teacher who, or you're a teacher who hasn't used primary sources, this the most simple way that I approached it was just notice, ask, and understand. And my students kind of got used to that. So for notice, I had them start with the five W's, you know, who is in this text? What is going on? When did this take place? Where did this take place? Why, you know, why might this be happening? And really asking students like, what stands out to you when you look at this primary source? And then really encouraging them to zoom in, you know, what, what might you have missed? What are the details there? What more can you find? And really teaching students whether, again, whether it's print or visual or a video, really to notice and kind of slow down and look at the details. And then the second task I ask students to do is ask, ask questions. Generate as many questions as you can about the source, who created it, when, why, who's the audience, um, you know, just really, even if you, even if they don't know the answer, just, you know, generating that curiosity um, about the source. And then understanding. So using maybe inference, using the clues, um, putting everything together, what is going on? Um, in this source? How does it make you feel? What surprises you? What contradictions do you find? Why might this text be important? So this, that's just kind of a basic way to start to approach the, any primary source, whatever you're taking a look at. But like Greta pointed out, there is so much um, teacher material included with these primary source sets. 
um, that I just feel like it's just a real easy way to incorporate into the classroom. So I just pulled out um, a screenshot of the World War I and the Minnesota home front primary source set. And again, as Rita or as Greta pointed out on the um, side, we have the primary source analysis that you could use for any primary source. But then I love that these authors have created specific discussion questions um, designed specifically for that set. So I can see teachers pulling out, you know, one question or a group of questions um, or creating, having students create their own questions about the primary source that would be a great lesson as well. Um, here's a really great question um, that was uh, in this primary source set, and I think this was written by Carla Urban, who is a former outreach coordinator at Minitex. So this would be <laughs> this would be a great lesson in itself. Just this question. So she um, pointed out the three images. Have them side by side here. Think about these three images: the African American men on the train. The Native American man rejected from service and um, the German man registered as an alien enemy. So having students really slow down and taking a look using that notice, ask and understand about the individual sources and then taking a look at them together. Um, you know, what do they tell you about the attitudes toward people of different races and ethnicities at this time? Um, and again, think about how powerful that is for students to come up with their own ideas about that based on these primary sources um, versus, you know, just reading in a textbook what some author thinks the attitudes were. So I love um, some of these really deep critical thinking questions that are included in those teaching guides. Um, as Greta pointed out, there are also links to other really amazing educator resources. So this, these document analysis worksheets from the National Archives are great. Um, again, kind of helps you break apart the primary source um, and then put it back together to kind of make sense of it. And the Library of Congress also has some really great resources here. So between the teaching guides, the National Archives and the Library of Congress, there's just so much material there for teachers to um, pick and choose from. And then um, as Greta was mentioning, you know, the, the third goal of these primary source sets is really to um, introduce students and teachers to the amazing, um, resources that we have um, available to us in Minnesota. So that eLibrary Minnesota resources will link to some of the databases that we have. And if you haven't been, this is the, the portal page for eLibrary Minnesota. And all of these resources can be find un, found under student research. So Britannica School, um, Gales Product, um, Student Resources in Context now called Middle School, um, or high school in context, and then some other really great uh, databases that we have. And then the additional resources for research are also so helpful. They're just curated websites that um, teachers and parents can trust that if their students go to these websites, they're gonna be credible sources, they're gonna be age appropriate, um, and they're gonna be very useful for their topic. So these are already curated, they're right there. Um, it's just really an amazing resource for teachers. And I would just love um, for more teachers to know about these um, primary source sets. Um, and to create more and share how they're using them in the classroom. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Greta. Linda, um, I just wanted to remind everyone that, that you can join us next week for a second webinar on guest authoring a primary source set. And this is going to be on Friday, April 24th from 10 to 11 and um, it will be everything you need to know about writing your own primary source set. So with that, um, Linda and I would really like to thank you for joining us today. And now we would like to open things up for your questions. And um, you can unmute yourself and ask a question or you can ask a question in the chat.
Okay, I see one question coming through here. Uh, how do you identify which organizations you partner with? That's a great question. Um, really, it's about um, the fact that we we partner with cultural heritage nonprofit organizations, meaning we don't work with corporations. So, um, so any cultural heritage organization that holds an archival collection of materials that they would like to share more widely with the Minnesota audience. And um, we have a second person on staff with the Minnesota Digital Library. Her name's Molly Huber, and she's the outreach coordinator. So she helps um, potential partners walk through the steps of what, um, what you would need to do to become a partner and to contribute your materials. And um, so I think the other thing I would just add is, you know, because of um, the way we're structured, we don't, you know, we don't work with for-profit organizations and we don't work with individuals. So, and I see we have another question. Mm -hmm. Have you received or gathered feedback from teachers or students who have used primary source sets? We received a little bit, Jane, um, not, um, not, not necessarily a lot of constructive feedback. We tend to get feedback that says, these are great for the people that are using them. But again, um, one of our goals is that we're always trying to raise awareness and get more teachers involved with using them because I don't, I don't feel like we necessarily, I, I don't think we're reaching all, everyone that we could be reaching, so. Oh, and one thing I should add, we do also, in terms of um, tracking usage and usage analysis, we do track usage with Google Analytics. And um, so that's one way where we're getting a sense of how much they're being used. And um, feedback is, is gathered through um, the email, email. And then also there is a feedback um, link at the bottom of each primary source set that says, would you like to share feedback on this primary source set? So that comes in through my email. And again, most of it is just people saying, this is great, not necessarily a lot of constructive comments. So. Couple more came in, Greta. I don't know if you want to just, yeah, looks like you have the chat up, so. <laughs> can you talk a little bit about how your service format is different or same from the Minnesota Historical Society research guides? Um, well, I am not super familiar with the research guides, but I would imagine those are things that are geared toward the Minnesota Historical Society collection, whereas we are working with 197 contributing organizations and sharing their content. So, um, so I think, I think, you know, in some ways, maybe Minnesota Historical Society is sharing information about their own collection outward, and we are sharing collect information about um, topics from our, con from a whole array of statewide contributors. I think that's probably one of the main differences. And if we don't have content in Minnesota Reflections, it's not something that we prefer, we would pr pursue as a topic, meaning I wouldn't, I remember one time somebody asked me if I, um, if we had a primary source set on the Oregon Trail, and I was like, no, we don't, because we don't have anything in Minnesota Reflections related to that. So, um, and then the second collection is from Maureen, and she says, what if we, what if we are aware of images held by our public library that we think would fit with a set but aren't in Minnesota Digital Library? Um, I think that would, again, you're looking at kind of that's a contribution question. Um, you know, if your public library does have a lot of archival um, historic materials, maybe you should mention to them that they should pursue or think about becoming a um, a partner with the Minnesota Digital Library. And that would involve, again, working with Molly and developing an application and going through the application process. Um, so we don't share anything in the primary source sets that, again, it's not in reflections. So some people, again, are like, why aren't you sharing images from DPLA or from other organizations? We really want this to be focused on what, we, what users can find in a single place that's based on Minnesota history. So. 
Yeah, and Greta, I just wanted to add a little bit. I'm going to go back to the previous question. Um, I actually did. I worked at um, the Historical Society for a bit and wrote some research guides. Okay, so, great. Ready? Yeah, so I think they're pretty similar. I mean, really, it's about linking to items that um, we have access to. Of course, um, one of the differences is that these primary source sets are all digitized. So these can be accessed, you know, this, this is great. Some of the um, historical society sources are print and you have to, um, you know, go there and, and order the, the box of things to, you know, be sent up to the library. So that's one difference that these are digitized. But the other, the main difference that I see is just like what I was talking about, just the really the, the wealth of teaching material that comes along with these primary source sets, that teaching guide, the links to um, how to use them in the classroom. So I feel like this is, um, these primary source sets are a little bit, um, I guess they're more designed for use in the classroom than those um, historical society research guides, if that helps. Thank you, Linda, that does help a lot. So, so I see a question from Greg who asks, what are the main copyright concerns in having so many contributing organizations to the content? Um, I think really the cop copyright concerns for this project are very low because um, we, when Molly Huber works with a contributing organization to share their content in Minnesota Reflections, they're agreeing to the idea and to the concept that they are sharing their content in Minnesota Reflections with the, with the idea, the hope, the, the goal that people are going to look at it, they might download it, um, they might use, you know, might use that image for genealogy purposes or research purposes, not, not to sell it or monetize it in any way, but you're making your content available for people to look at it. And um, so really the primary source sets, they're taking content that's already in Minnesota Reflections. So those contributors have agreed to that basic principle of wanting to share content for the greater good. And um, it's just packaging up that existing content in a slightly different way. And we're, we're referring people back to the record in Minnesota Reflections. So I'm not making new records. I'm really in a sense redirecting people back to Minnesota Reflections. And, um, and so it's just putting in it, and for, for us, it's also an opportunity to pull resources together from different contributors and show it in a different way. And, um, you know, making more of a curated collection. But um, in many ways, we have no more concerns about the copyright of a primary source set than we do with any other thing that we share in Minnesota Reflections. All right, any other questions that anyone has? And I also just wanna remind you that on the, the end slide there, um, Linda and I have shared both of our emails. So if you think of a question later, um, I always think of my best questions after something is over, um, please don't hesitate to email us and we will be happy to, to answer your questions. We saw a comment come through. Looks like people are saying thank you and they found it useful and Great. informative. Yeah. Well, thank, well thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. Yeah, and thanks. come join us next week. Um, is registration still open for the guest author? Yes. Session? All right. Yep. If you're interested in getting more involved, I would really like to encourage you to think about attending next week as well. So. Yep. And thank you to Greta and Linda, our presenters. I'll clap since I'm the only one that's not, <laughs> not muted. Thank you. Um, and all of you will hear from me at least one more time. I'll follow up with a link to the recording um, and ask for some feedback. So thank you very much, everyone. Great. Thanks. Have a great day. Have a great day.